Welcome and thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon, this virtual event with uh, prize-winning acclaimed author Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. My name is Paul Grandal, and I'm the Opalka Endowed Director of the New York State Writers Institute here at the University of Albany. I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the UAlbany Alumni Association, the English Department's Creative Writing Program, and the Young Writers Program. You can find about Find out about all the rest of our upcoming events this spring at our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. You can also sign up there for our mailing list. Just a couple words of introduction about our very special guest, Nana. He received his bachelor's degree in English here at UAlbany in 2013. He will be honored as a distinguished alumnus and presented with the Excellence in Arts and Letters Awards at the 53rd annual UAlbany Alumni Association's Excellence Awards Gala on April 22nd in Albany. I look forward to congratulating you, Nana, in person at that gala event. Nana has returned graciously several times to campus to participate in Writers Institute events, including our Albany Book Festival in 2021. I'd also remind you at this point that our campus bookstore, uh, the UAlbany Campus Bookstore, will take pre-orders of Nana's forthcoming novel, which we'll hear a lot about this afternoon. He earned his MFA uh, from Syracuse University and won widespread literary acclaim for his debut short story collection, Friday Black, published in 2018. He received a rave review on the cover of the New York Times Book Review, and many critics named it one of the best works of fiction that year. It received too many literary awards for us to mention, but it was impressive. And now we're super excited about Nana's highly anticipated follow-up to Friday Black. It's his debut novel, Chain Gang All-Stars. It will be published by Pantheon on May 2nd. So this is pretty special. You're getting a sneak preview. And the publisher was kind enough to send us an advanced edition, just got in this morning. I was reading through it. it, it it's so beautiful, Nana. And uh, it's, it's getting this huge advance attention and praise. Uh, Publishers Weekly, for instance, called it breathtaking and pulse pounding. In a star review, Kirkus described it as an acerbic, poignant, and at times alarmingly pertinent dystopian novel. It's been described as a cross between Gladiator and The Hunger Games. And Goodreads proclaimed it, quote, the buzziest book of the year and called it a ferocious attack on America's for-profit prison system. Please welcome Nana Kwame Anya Brenya. Thanks for being here, Nana. How does that feel, all that praise, man? It's, you've got another few weeks before it's out in the world. Thank you so much. Um, it feels great. I mean, I kind of have to dissociate while people are reading those things because I feel like it's too stressful to hear it all. So I just kind of like totally go to somewhere else but I the part of me that can hear it is um extremely humbled and extremely grateful and um it's always a pleasure to come back uh to the space you see I'm repping too you see my all right gear on. same here I see you and um but yeah it feels it's uh, a little overwhelming but also it's um I'm glad that it's almost here I really I really wish it was just out all this like sort of pre-time is pretty stressful to me, but um, I'm grateful that it seems like people might be engaged. So I feel uh, extremely grateful just to get to hear any of it. That's beautiful. I know your publisher has a lot of uh, excitement. Uh, where will your book tour take you? Do you know the cities you'll be traveling to? Whew, a bunch of cities now. Um, we start in New York, um, up in the Schomburg Center. And uh, then we go to Massachusetts. We go, it, it goes all the way across. We go to Atlanta. I think we're going to be, I know we're going to be in LA and um, the Bay Area, San Francisco. Um, towards the end, we go to Boise, Idaho, which is not a place that I ever thought I'd get to go. So Boise, Idaho. And that's the American part. And then after that, it, it goes to the, um, the UK side, which is a whole other beast later on. That's great. That's going to be fantastic. We're looking forward to uh, have fun with it. Yeah, to seeing a lot of you. Um, 
I wanted to ask, since Friday Black was such extraordinary attention and acclaim for a first debut collection, did you feel any extra pressure, that thing called the sophomore slump? You know, a lot of yeah. artists feel that the follow-up book doesn't always come easy. There's there's doubts, there's yeah. imposter sy syndrome. I mean, did you deal with any of that? I mean, so much happened between my first and second books. Uh, my first book came out in 2018. And between 2018 and now, I don't know about y'all, but <laughs> a lot has gone down. Um, leave alone artist life, just in terms of life generally. Um, so I feel like between then and now, I've become like an adult in a more truer sense. Uh, a, a few months after, six months after my first book came out, my father passed. Um, then uh, the whole world was sort of in this in pandemic mode for several years after that. And um, so besides the challenges that come naturally, I guess, with trying to follow up a book, uh, there was just a lot that came from life, you know, life doing its thing. And, but in terms of pressure, because of the real life stuff, the book, which is, you know, I'm, I work pretty, I, I can get obsessively one track minded and consumed. The book could be both everything, but also pretty small. You know, I try to keep things in context. Like I said, like so much was happening. And um, I let the book just be one thing, part of my routine, my the thing I do every day, but try not to let it be like too scary. But that said, there was a lot of pressure, but not from externally. I don't feel, I don't, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm blessed or cursed. I don't feel too much fear about the book doing well in the eyes of like the public or something. Uh, I feel sort of confident that that will happen, even though it's outside of those these early reviews, I'm always just concerned about how I'll handle whatever comes, you know? And so, um, but I, I, I'm truly not scared. The pressure I felt was more just like the life stuff. And so I just grinded. It took me a long time, but we finally got here. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry about your father's passing, but you, you have a beautiful dedication to your father and you mentioned him the acknowledgements uh, throughout yeah. and, and, and your mother. Um, but this is such a wildly original story. I think that's what, you know, people are so excited about. Um, can you talk about the genesis of it? And do you want me to kind of give the quick recap or do you about <laughs> who are the chain gang all-stars and how are they, uh, prisoners and how are they in this gladiatorial contest yeah. do you want to talk about that um I, I, I could do it real quick um so the book the new book is about imagined future in which convicted wards of state can opt out of a sentence of at least 25 years to participate in death matches and so that's like the idea and uh if they survive at least three years or three years they get to be they get clemency they're freed and the story follows primarily a woman named Loretta Thurwar, who is like the most winningest link in the game. That's what the participants are called, the links, as in like links in the chain. And uh, she's on the cusp of being freed. And the book follows her and her partner, one of her partners, and like a teammate almost, another woman named Stax, as they sort of try to figure out their situation with Thurwar's impending... Uh, uh, potential freeing approaching. And so that's the idea of the book. And I, I originally had the idea as a short story for that. I would, that was going to be in my first book, Friday Black. I just had the idea of a, of like a woman in the eye of the Coliseum, someone in the middle of like a huge stadium expressing her, like sort of a boiling or a simmering anger at the crowd, but not letting it show because she didn't want to give them like the show that they wanted um and that that was the I had that original idea and I knew that it was somehow related to prison and I think after having started that story I was like huh I guess I should probably do some research and once I started doing the research regarding the nature of the carceral system in America it just opened the floodgates to ideas and um it I, I pretty quickly found that it couldn't be a short story anymore yeah, the amount of research, all the uh, books and and uh, investigations report you cite in the acknowledgments. I mean, you you went deep. Um, that means a lot and, coming and from really, you. I appreciate that. 
you became a scholar in a way in, 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 in decades and generations of prison studies, but then you turned it on its head with this wildly um, brutal cross between WWE and like, you know, yeah. the ancient gladiators. How did you want to use fiction to get out those very difficult truths of mass incarceration, disproportionate number of blacks in prison, the death penalty for profit? You know, since so many people had written about it in nonfiction, how could fiction get at some of those truths in a deeper way? I think that fiction, for me anyways, I think this is like sort of my role in like the the, the movement, if you want to call it that, is I can sort of remind us like where we already are is, is dystopic, is horrific. I think when you say the death penalty, it's sort of become kind of part of like a cultural, like just we have that phrase, the death penalty. But when we read a story like... Um, Oh, now I'm forgetting the name of the story. The one where it ends with them stoning someone. Uh, anyways, the whatever. The lottery. The lottery. The lottery. When you lead a story like the lottery, you know, you feel like that's barbaric. That's terrible. That's bad. But when we know the fact, but when you think about the reality of um, uh, what the death penalty is and state-sponsored murder and and how especially when you consider the, the number or the percentage of people who are incarcerated who suffer from mental health issues, how the majority of people suffer from drug addiction issues or substance abuse issues. It becomes just as violent or scary or dystopic as something like the lottery or something out of science fiction or whatever you want to call it. So for me, I, I feel like I can translate what's already there into this way that seems like hyperbole, but is actually just a, another way of looking at it. I think that some of the best ways of, I think that euphemism can be like really violent. And I think that we have ability to sort of relegate crazy insidious evil to these sort of euphemisms or things that almost become devoid of meaning or pain. The death penalty, it sounds like a game. Like you got the death penalty, like, like, you, like you lost and the price is right. But it means that the government is going to murder someone. <laughs> Either through a very expensive cocktail of, toxins that some countries don't even like to sell to America anymore for that reason or through like electricity and again we have this thing as though like that's somehow not the same as hanging someone by their neck or getting a firing squad I guess because it's a little bit tidier or something but uh it's not it's 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 state-sponsored murder and so um I feel that I can present, I could remind us to see these things as they are and, and not even try to force you to make it say that this is right or wrong, but like remind us that like, this is that, that thing that we supposedly don't like, it's that. Um, and so for me, that's some of the power of fiction and some of the power of using some of the uh, genre elements that I use is to remind us that exactly what we see uh, or some of the things we don't allow ourselves to see all the time are extremely brutal. And I think we kind of tend to forget that. Do you see yourself as an activist as much as a novelist? I mean, you've been steeped in the, the, the writings of like Angela Davis, you mentioned other black activists. Is writing this novel your form of, you know, holding a vigil or making a march or, or um, yeah. you know, protesting about the, the terrible inhumanities against incarcerated people? Well, I have a lot of respect and reverence for activists. And in such, and I do also work in like with my my body to like do that work as well with a group called the Rockland Coalition to End a New Jim Crow in Spring in Rockland County where I'm from. Um, I I do think it's my it's it is my contribution to a movement. I I hesitate to, hesitate to say it is my activism because I almost feel like. That makes me feel like I could be satisfied with just writing the book or something. And I think there has to be more, but it is, it is a contribution in that sense. And, it, and in literary spaces or literary world, sometimes that feels like you don't want to say that because that feels reductive. And again, I, I try my best not to be didactic or tell, or, or, or be like, this is how you should do things. But I told a story of these characters who are shaped by a system. 
And I know how I feel about the system, but rather than saying this system's right or wrong, I just I just present it in a way that feels true to me and hope that the reader could come to um come to um their own sort of conclusions. But I guess what I do hope no matter what, and sort of the power of the activism I hope to do is to get people to remind themselves of their power and that just because they don't see it doesn't mean it can't be. A lot of times I, I could I already foresee like when you start talking about abolition. People start immediately go, okay, so what do you want to do with the murders and the rapists? You know, that's like how you go straight to it, boom. And the response for me is number one, the thing we're doing now is not working. Its efficacy is low, you know? So that's already a fact. It's a fact that nothing increases your chances of going to prison more than going to prison. You know what I mean? Like, like going to prison, nothing else will be a marker for you going to prison again than having gone to prison. So it's a way of, that's an, I'm saying it doesn't work. I, I, I want, I, so, so for me, it's not my place to be like, this is what we should do. Even though I have some ideas, it's, it's about us as a collective getting the ability to sort of believe in our ability to reimagine spaces and really try to value compassion as that fundamental guiding tool. And I hope that the book can be a small piece of a tiny drop in that bucket. And so if that's my activism, that's activism. But I also think that uh, as a human living in the world, it's probably my job to do more than just write the book and say, I did it. It's a great question. You also, I mean, there's this fire burning in you throughout. I, I, I was thinking of James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. I mean, you, you are seething with your anger and you, you, the backdrop is so violent and so gory. And yet you bring out the humanity and, and on an individual level, each people. And I love the ep epigraph you started with. And I want to ask you, Kendrick Lamar, I hope the universe love you today. Can you talk about that and, and, and why that resonated and, and why it speaks to these People have really been forgotten. You're giving voice to the voiceless. I, I wrote a lot about prison issues and, and went into prisons and interviewed a lot of formerly incarcerated and incarcerated people. They're desperate to, to share their story because they are in lockdown so many ways that, that their truth can't get out. And you're giving a whole life to these people. So can you talk about how you found that, that love and humanness in this totally inhumane you know, landscape? You. I appreciate it uh, once again. I think part of the part of the like to me like what's most pernicious or dangerous about the current carceral system is it gets us to believe that humanity is negotiable. I think it's sort of like well, if you you're you get to be considered worthy of love until this, until that, and that fundament that just being in the air. I think it kind of poisons all of us. I think it makes us all, even on our best day, think, well, there are terms where, you know what, just got to get them out of there. And, and I think that just being the standard is really violent towards everyone. But in terms of like, uh, I hope the universe love you today. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is I, I really hope that we can get to the place where love is really like that fundamental space that fundamental like place where we move from right now it's sort of like a, it's the Hammurabi thing right now. It's sort of like you do bad, the bad happens to you. We don't have communities don't have the, the current car social system necessarily robs us of the ability to like think through eth moral ethical issues as a community. I have a friend. This is a, this is our, this is our system. This is like a real life example. that's on my mind right now. I have a friend who uh, a family member of a close friend of mine is really scared to call the police because they 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 have a brother who is experiencing a manic episode, and they don't know what to do, right? And they the the episode get is getting increased the the manic the man is getting increasingly uh, aggressive, and it's obviously someone they love, but they don't know what to do because they know that if they call the police, who are all trying to call in these moments it's very likely that that person might be killed, <laughs> harmed at the very least. And that's just our, and that's just our, and that's just how we live. <laughs> and 
There's a number, there's a number we all know to call, but the people that come when you do that may kill you. And that's just like the standard. Of course, there are um, some communities have um, mental health crisis, warm lines or hotlines, not all communities, some of them do. Um, but again, because compassion is not our fundamental principle, that's more rare. That's not the, that's not the automatic thing. So people are forced to be at, at wit's end because there is no, the response is forced. The, the default response is, is arrest and control as opposed to compassion, care, understanding. And so, um, sorry, I kind of went on my like soapbox and forgot where I was going with the answer to the question, but it, I guess for me, it's like there, I know there's a version that's much better than this. And I think that if we as a community try to find that, uh, everything could be different. And with this, the sort of seething anger part, with the group I was talking about, the Rockin' Coalition and the New Jim Crow, we just had a like a, a meeting about mental health and social justice. So this is kind of on my mind right now. Even for myself, I realize how the sort of general lack of compassion in our community spaces has shaped my own understanding of like what I deserve or what is okay. Or when I have had people in my own life and my immediate family who are going through mental health crises and feeling like the answer is just be quiet. <laughs> Just, just hope because there is no one who can help you because you don't want the people with the guns to come to your house. So again, so that's on the outside part. When the, in terms of the people on the inside, the people currently incarcerated, those people are humans. Most of them are suffering greatly from either substance abuse or from uh, uh, mental health issues. And say, even if, and even if they are not, and even if they are not, um, do we feel like, oh, like having murder on the table works? We're the only quote unquote advanced democracy that does it. So, you know, that feels strange. Anyway, sorry. I could <laughs> I could start ranting about it. But and the there is a sort of undertone of like like sadness or anger in the in my whole thing, even though like I'm sort of a funny with it too. It's because I just it's murder. <laughs> the government sometimes murders people. And like, we just don't care. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, yeah. The absurdity <laughs> comes out uh, in the book, but I also want to ask you what you hope readers take from this book. For instance, I, I hope prisoners and, and incarcerated people will be able to read this book. I fear though that, that guards and administrators might try to ban it or keep it out. I, I actually hope that... Yeah. Maybe we could buy some books and, and send it to some of our local, uh, you know, uh, state correctional facilities, as they're called. Um, yeah, what are, you, what are you hoping for in terms of response? I would, I'm hoping for that to happen as well, and I'm going to try my best to do it. It gets, it's, it's luckily, like, you know, with the banning, which is happening rampantly, we'll see what happens with this one. If you make a certain amount of noise, there's a great chance it will happen. I hope that Excuse me. And I, and I also, I also like need to like probably like put like and make it really clear that for me, these answers aren't like some easily attained thing either. I, I think I, because it's not the standard, I had to, um, I think I wrote this book hoping I was an abolitionist. And in doing, and through the process of doing the research, I discovered I was, you know, I, but I was, I didn't really know because I just sort of like a, in the kind of popular vernacular, especially since George Floyd, I think abolition is in the sort of zeitgeist, but kind of shallowly. I don't think people are really like thinking about what that means when they're claiming that. Um, and not to, I don't mean it to be kind of sending at all, but I think it's what I mean to say is that many people default responses to issues or ideas that they disagree with are carceral. And um, we can evolve past that if you try. And so um, I hope that the book can first help give people a history lesson, hope a little bit. I mean, number one, I hope the book is engaging, entertaining. That's like how I, my fundamental, like as a teacher, pedagogically, that's kind of my standard, my foundation. And I hope people take it and enjoy reading it. But I hope they are reminded that they can reimagine spaces and communities, not someone else, but you yourself. Like we individually can be the person who makes something different. And if we get a critical mass of people who think like that, who knows what we could do? That's what I guess I hope for above everything else. That's beautiful. Thank you. And 
We've got students from uh, Mary Valentis's uh, English 350 class with us. I'm going to turn it over. Um, but one last question before we ask uh, both online and the audience here. Um, you were here at U Albany. You were part of the English department. You've you've acknowledged and thanked uh, Lynn Tillman, Ed Schwarzschild, and Professor two Schwarzschild. Yeah, two well. two professors here who are also part of the Writers Institute. What did you take away from that? How did they help you believe that you could be a writer and, and get you on to this path of, of success? And it's not just those two, but those two who are primary because those are my creative writing professors. But there's others, and I think I see some of them here who really helped me in ways that I didn't couldn't even realize. Then I remember the first time I used like a microfiche in um in in, in classes in my English department and that research, I'm sure it sort of some seeds of that helped me with this book too. But in terms of Professor Schwarzschild and Professor Tillman, in some ways, just like, I mean, number one, just introducing me to things to read. So I read ZZ Packer because of Ed Schwarzschild, Professor Schwarzschild, and um, that book was drinking coffee elsewhere and then becoming like some like real, like opening up my imagination of what could be valid, quote unquote, literature or whatever. So that was huge for me um and uh and professor tillman of course sort of was my first like true 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 mentor in the sense that i kind of told her like, i want to be a writer and she like didn't laugh at me you know she like kind of took it serious or at least she felt like she took it serious i'm still cool with her. i'm gonna think i'm gonna meet with her next week um so it was really to for me, it was really that they offered me the space to even have like the I, the courage to claim I was interested in being a writer out loud, you know. And um they both also introduced me to great writers. They both also demystify what it meant. Cause sometimes, you know, some writers have this like that or this aura about them about themselves that's either real or manufactured, that it's like some that there's some otherworldly beings, but they kind of reminded me that everybody's just like a person. And uh, that was very helpful for me. Thank you. Um, who has a question for Nana uh, in the audience here? There's one in back. And I'll repeat it. If uh, You should be able to hear it. She's got a microphone. Mm -hmm. Can't necessarily see the person. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Hi. Hey. So as, um, as an abolitionist, um, a Marxist, a communist, someone who's just very leftist in general, very strong political affiliations in that in, in that aspect. How did you um, manage, um, I guess, sort of merging your political affiliations with or political stances with your art in a way that felt true and not manufactured? I have yeah. a difficulty with doing that myself. It doesn't come off as like attempting to radicalize people. And I think that when you're an artist, you should first focus on like showcasing your art instead yeah. of showcasing your opinion and i have difficulty with that kind of <laughs> dichotomy so I was yeah wondering how managed to handle that i feel like we have like similar vibes um i think that if you can focus on writing a story that feels engaging and entertaining to you and just and, and i'm i'm saying this judging by like uh how you you spoke just now i think you don't got to worry about like your the radicalizing element coming through i think it will it, it, it sort of will be there. Like for me, like if you can believe it, like my first book, I never, it has a lot of short stories that deal with racism and hyper-consumerism, all these things. I never thought like, I'm going to write a story like that's about this. And even, even in Tang Gang, like I know what it's about, but I didn't set out to write some like abolitionist, abolitionist manifest, manifesto. You know, I kind of pre pretty quickly discovered what was happening and I didn't resist what it was becoming. But what, what was on my heart came out. And so also, 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 I feel like if you write something that feels too, <laughs> too like you're trying to radicalize people, like that might be, that might be dope. Like that might be cool. You know, I, <laughs> oh, I'm sort of on that side of, about that stuff too. Cause you, sometimes you have to do that to see. I, the example I give actually often is, when I was at Albany, actually, my I was there when Trayvon Martin was murdered. I don't know if I know some kids, some of the young people don't even maybe know who that is. I was in UA when Trayvon Martin was murdered, and me and my bro, who was also in school with me, we made this pamphlet anonymously, and we 
this shit, we got printed like 500 copies with like the little money I had working at uh, Against All Odds in the Crossgates Mall. And um, we disseminated like a bunch of them around the campus at like three in the morning on the main, on the, on the, like on the, around the, on the podium. And uh, <laughs> I went to, and it was very like didactic, very, you should be like this type of thing. And to use your words, maybe probably trying to radicalize people. Um, and, and, you know, I went to bed with a self-righteous kind of feeling like, well, you know, we fixed racism. Good job to us. And the next <laughs> morning, I thought I was going to wake up to a new world order. And of course, like nothing that really happened. We were pretty much just littered. And I kind of, I was sad about that. And it wasn't only that I was just trying to radicalize people directly, which was what is failing. Also, was I wasn't that good of a writer at the time. I didn't, I didn't, I took for granted that people have a lot of competing interests and things have to be interesting to them. And so, like, I don't, over present or over hide my like political allegiances i think pretty pretty people can pretty much see my vibes but i also understand that like people want to be entertained and i have no problem doing that it's, it doesn't feel contrary to my purposes at large um and so that's why i say like try try how see what your art looks like when you're not at all pulling any punches in terms of trying to like hide any radical radicalizing element and see how that looks and if you if it's not hitting then you know you try again but uh, growing your craft and figuring out how you tell a story or how you, how, whatever your medium is, um, you can do that and separately or connectedly grow your interest and your knowledge about the subjects you care about. And I feel that as long as you don't resist, at least this has been my experience, as, as long as I don't resist adding, uh, following any like impulses to include directly the subjects I care about in my non-art making portion of my life, the work kind of happens. But that's my experience. It's a really good question. Sorry, it's a long answer. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Who, who's got another question for Nan? If you just raise your hand, we'll get you the microphone so everyone can hear. And then we will be going to the virtual audience too at some point. Just we're going to talk we to We didn't a few forget people about you, first. virtual audience. We didn't we forget the virtual. Too. Um. Did you face any challenges uh, as your main character being a woman? Um, like, how did you sort of approach that, obviously being a male author? <laughs> In Chang Gang? Yeah. The new book? Um, uh, not really. You know, it's weird. Like, I mean, I have uh, female protagonists and narrators in my first book, in my short story collection. A lot of people seem to feel as though it's like very difficult I don't know. I don't have that. I didn't have the difficulty. I mean, I also have several different narrators, um, male and female and gender nonconforming. Um, I kind of just think about in the case of third ones and stacks, as opposed to just thinking of them as like, I guess, woman broadly, I think of them as like very specific individuals in a very specific situation. And it helps me feel uh, more like it wasn't as much of a, I mean, it's still very challenging because the, writing the book is super hard, but um, I just think, I think of both Stir War and Stax as the two, who are the two lead women in the book as Stir War and Stax, who are very specific women, a specific place in a specific time. And um, that helps me sort of write them to the best of my ability, I think. Thank you. I think, did you have a question? Up here? Did you? Yeah, right here. Hi, sorry, my voice is a little messed up right now. You're all um, good. Sounds cool. Uh, but I had essentially a question. Do you uh do you have, I guess, any um advice or ideas for how to like practically organize around um prison abolition and the kind of discussions uh to engage in with people who might not be super familiar with the concept? uh in order to organize around that and pushing for those things yeah there's a lot of things you could do number one is there's almost certainly people on a small level group around you already so i always like point people to that like i said i'm with a group that existed before i really was thinking about abolition and they have become a great avenue for me that rockland coalition i've mentioned many times now so looking for what exists around you already is is one avenue um 
sometimes it can be as simple as a book club. If you have a book club and one day you read, and that, that group I'm talking about started because they read the Michelle Alexander um, book. And so, uh, and now several years later, they're a community organization. So sometimes it might be, um, you have a book club and now you guys are all going to read. We do that. We do this till they, till they free us, you know, and, and now the ideas are, 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 are bubbling. Um, it might be, um, reading even just an article or two of Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore or, uh, Angela Davis. Uh, so there's so many ways of doing it. A gra a very, very grassroots version is, I was with this group called the Unity Collective over the pandemic, and we decided we were going to create like a 30 day like mailing list slash like challenge an abolition like challenge. And the process of doing it forced us to think through these issues It made us we read a bunch of articles we thought about the reality of like political agency we got we started it made, it made even me think about the census differently, but it could be some, something something small like that. I think once you get a couple of people thinking about subjects, usually a, a, a organized like a, a initial text as a spark plug or or maybe even a movie as a spark plug can help a lot. Um, but I would always try to point people to like look to see what's already around you because there's a lot of people doing the work, and so that's always a, a a great starting place. It's a really great question, and I'm like and I, and on uh in academia. There's a lot of opportunities because if you want it to be and it doesn't exist, you could, it could literally be like, okay, I'm starting a new club. First thing we're going to do is I'll read an art, this article and talk about it. And you could grow from there. That's great. Thank you. Do we want to take a couple uh, online, Jen? Sure. Um, there was one submitted in the chat a while ago from Gabriel. Um, were your parents supportive? If not, how did you escape the African parent expectations and embrace <laughs> your creative identity? <laughs> what do you mean? No, I know exactly what you mean. Um, for those who don't know, the idea is my parents are both Ghanaian immigrants. And, you know, for Ghanaian immigrants, the stereotype is sort of like you have to be either a doctor or engineer or a teacher or a lawyer. <laughs> surprise, surprise. My dad was a lawyer. My mom was a teacher. Um, before um, they got sick and weren't, couldn't work anymore. Uh, my parents were not... <laughs> particularly supportive in that sense that I think you're talking about, but I didn't, I think I had a pretty particular situation. Um, when I, before I got to school, many years before I got to Albany, my mother got sick. And so our sort of financial situation was sort of defined by this. And I guess because of that, I was already like fundamentally distrustful of like the sort of safe route. I had already seen it kind of not work in my opinion. Um, and writing, unfortunately, because it's, I mean, it's not free because it takes a lot of time, but it's more or less free. I could do it without someone like supporting it. I could secretly, not secretly, I could, my parents, they were there, but they did support me in the sense that they were like read a lot. Um, so I would go to the library a lot. And by the time I was in school, they weren't because so much was happening and they were all stressed out and blah, blah, blah. When I was at Albany, it's not like, I should have had a kind of independence pretty early on, I think, than, than some people might have it. I wasn't like in the situation where I was like asking my parents, should I be this major or that major? You know, which has negatives maybe too, but I, I did not, I wasn't in that, that wasn't my situation. Or if it was, it felt, it was false. It was like, or if like, I'm going to be English major, like, okay, you know? Um, so I got weirdly luck. And, but also I, by the by the time I was getting older, I, I really hit again for better or worse, I was sort of like doing my own thing. Um and so um I I I feel like I don't know. I had like a certain kind of energy that I was just kind of moving my own in my own direction. And I'm trying to think of the other part of the question. Um did I da, 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 da. Yeah, I like to write and it was free. And so I did it as like this like last, as this like ridiculous effort to try to fix things for my family financially, which is a crazy thing to do to try to be a writer for that reason. But um, yeah, I didn't really ask. I sort of just took a leap. And it's not that satisfactory for some people, but I think what I think can hopefully be helpful is 
your parents are your parents and you are you, you know, that's really how I view it. And that's, I don't know, maybe blasphemous for some people, but that's, that's just how I see it. Thank you for that. We have another online question, Jen. Yeah, the next question is actually from Ed Schwartzchild. So I asked him in the chat, I'm going to make him unmute himself and he'll actually ask your his question live. There he is. <laughs> hey, Nana, I hope you can hear me okay. I hear you perfect. It's so great to see you. I'm just, I'm so, I'm just so pleased and amazed and, and, and you know, strangely proud of, of, of what you're doing. And it's just, it's just, it's just awesome to see you. And thank you so much for coming back to spend some time with us. So grateful. Uh, I can't wait to read the book. Uh, the last time I saw you was at the Albany Book Festival. I think I typed this into the chat. And, and at that point, you were having a great conversation with Dana Spiata yeah. uh, about, I mean, about many things. But one of the things was about the book that you, you had given her a draft of the book. And, and you guys were talking a bit about it. And I, I was just wondering if you could, you know, share a little bit about your revision process. Like, what yeah. was what was the hardest part of of going from the draft to the finished product? What was Dana saying? Was she right? Uh, and anything along those lines would be great to hear. And I, I can't wait to see you on the twenty second in live and in person. It's going to be exciting. Thank you so much. And that was a fun event for me because uh, I had two of my professors kind of like running it or with. It was really cool to be there with you and with Dana. Um, so my revision process was pretty thorough. I'm a big reviser. I think it's the biggest part of my process. Um, so, but the hardest part in getting this book done was just the initial draft because I like revision when I don't have a, a, a final, like at least a beginning to an end, I, I feel very uneasy and very stressed out. And I was like that for like four or five years in the case with this book. Um, I'm trying to not lie to you about what Dana said. Dana, uh, there were like some very specific parts she keyed in on. And she was a very early reader, excuse me. And so it was like, it was sort of about the voice in the couple of chapters and how she felt it was sort of like, not as specific as some other places. And she was totally right about that. And um, after I did that, I also did like a big change in, that, in terms of, I added some like really, really almost occasion of the novel occasion of the story element right in the beginning and I moved with like this like sort of almost secret I had been holding to the very end of the book to like chapter like six way early on it got revealed um so that was kind of those are some of the big revisions I did the some of the bigger the higher order stuff um but then I did a bunch of things I revised it back and forth with people and my editor for like a year and a half and so, and it was like, either I had it and I was working on it or my editor had it. So for, and during that period, it was like a lot was growing and changing. And I actually still felt like that was too fast because I, I had spent the first, my, I, I had worked on Friday Black technically since I was in Albany, you know? And so it was, it felt like a fast turnaround to revise it for like only two years, you know? <laughs> but hopefully I start moving a little bit faster because this pace is pretty crazy. <laughs> that's awesome i mean when, when you say like occasion of the novel stuff that you you had to you put in early on can you can you explain what that i don't yeah, know if yeah, i don't yeah. know what that means yeah so like basically like sometimes there'll be like a in um in the lion king like you know simba's born you know so that's like a way of thinking about it uh the thing that kind of like sets off the story like this maybe that first spark of the of a fuse um is sort of like to me like the occasion of the story or like i'm trying to think of other good examples for people but i'm not thinking one right now but yeah like it's like something big that caught that like in my mind puts pressure on most of if not all the main characters and forces things to be a little bit different than they were prior and so i i changed i added something like that early on thank you so much thank you for everything is there another question there, Jen? Uh, not currently, okay. but you're welcome to either unmute or you can raise your hand. Oh, Tyler Jones has one. All right, you can unmute and go ahead. Hello. <clears throat> so my question was, have you ever felt that you've been intimidated by other works of art? So I see you're an English alum of, of Albany. So maybe like if you're reading a Scarlet Letter or any of the Poe or any of the old classics, did any of that ever intimidate you to the point where you found it hard to want to keep writing 
Um, I read uh, because of um, and I'm forgetting his name. It was it was Lynn Tillman's old. He worked a little bit like her assistant, but he was a professor at the school too. I read Dennis Johnson's um, Jesus' Son in Albany, and I remember being like, "Whoa, like damn, like this is pretty crazy." But I don't know if I'm a crazy egoist or what. That's just not how I think about stuff. I'm always like, even back then before I was good, I was like, this is cold and this is cool, but like, you know, there's no reason I can't do that. And now if I, if I told you how I feel about myself, not, like, I feel like it's weird. Like I, I oscillate between feeling like I'm absolute trash. And then on the other side, I'm like, <laughs> it, it sounds bad of how I think I would say like, it's so no. I, when I read those kind of things, I'd be impressed, but I, I, I take it in, I absorb it. I feel grateful to have a chance to be exposed to it. And I viewed myself, I remember back then, um, besides then tell me Lydia Davis was also there. And I remember one time she told me, I, I was really like, you know, trying to meet with everybody. She told me like, oh, you're still very malleable as a writer. Like you can like, whoever you're reading, you kind of take on their form a little bit. I remember feeling like rogue from the X-Men when she told me that. And I still feel to some extent I can do that. I, that's why I'm, I'm sort of like, I think I could, like I feel just as comfortable working in realism as or surrealism or speculative fiction or sci-fi or human scale stuff. I don't really feel like bound by anything. And so when I read these like really great writers, let's go right to the top, like Toni Morrison. I know that she's doing things I probably can't do, but I also always in my mind imagine that I can do stuff that no one else can do either. That's just how I think of it. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you. I appreciate you. I want to ask while we're waiting for another question to come up. I mean, this novel is is complex. It's so rich. 360 pages. I, Friday Black might have been a no third way. of that. Or so, but huge. It's, it's a huge novel. There's, there's a lot of words in here, Nana. But I'm wondering that form where you have so much more room to you know, go off on little side detours and weave in uh, multiple layers compared to the short story is all about compression and making every word, every sentence count. Was that freeing to have more space? Was it a different experience than writing very short? I found it very scary because one of my, like, I guess, main ethos as a writer is I wanted to maintain that compression. I, I, I still want that feeling. That was like the big challenge. I never thought I would write a big book for that reason. <clears throat> I can't believe it's 360 pages. Um, because I always, I view myself as a writer who like really is like, um, cares a lot about con co like concision and economy. Uh, so I'm sort of surprised it got that big, but I, it felt like, for me, what was difficult, it actually felt more constraining. I, in some ways in my heart of hearts, I think I might be a short story writer, like as, as like my like default way of doing things, but it's almost why the chapter structure became what it is. It's almost every chapter has its own sort of arc. Excuse me. Every chapter has its own kind of, you know, mini resolution, not exactly resolution, but mini conflict that can be addressed. Uh, it felt, it was a challenge. It felt like I was swimming with no shore in sight and it was hard to grasp the energy. And I'm very like a energy based writer, which is why I think, I don't feel that's why I think it's why I feel comfortable working with whatever genre because the energy is the energy and I don't feel like I have to follow any particular genre constraint to access the energy, but it was, it was a challenge to me. It was actually more of a challenge. It felt weird in a certain kind of way and not in the way that people think. Like, I don't think a novel's harder. I think the fact that you could potentially, it could potentially be easier because of the space, as you mentioned it, made it more challenging for me personally as a writer because I really wanted to like keep my foot on its neck, so to speak, and not uh and not allow for too much space to uh, sort of um, you know, not be as vigilant as I can. Sentence level of vigilance is like what I try to pride myself most in as a writer. Well, thank you. Is there another question, Jen? Yep. Gabriel, you can unmute and ask your question. All right. So uh, you kind of explained to us your journey, you know, from being somebody that uh, initially, it seems, didn't believe that they could write uh, to somebody that, 
makes their living full time as an author now. And I was wondering what would you say is uh, probably the thing that people can do in order to free themselves to embrace a creative identity? It's a really good question, really important question. Um, it's, it's, there's so many different people in different situations, but what I would say is the earlier you can embrace uh, discipline as like a part of life, as like a necessary part of life, because a lot of us have a lot of ideas. A lot of us have a lot of energies. A lot of us have a lot of desires. Well, without discipline, it's like the wheels are spinning, but the tires aren't ain't on the road for real, you know? Um, and the gas is burning, but the, the car is going nowhere. Because at some point, you got to sit down. For me, this is the writing, right, the writer's exp, exp, like version. You got to sit down in front of a blank paper and not be afraid to write a word down. You got to write another word down. You got to write another word down. And then somehow you get to, to me, like I said, even I don't think I would ever write a book that's 362 pages. To me, that's shocking. But I didn't do that. What I did do was for a month, every day I could write a thousand words. You know, I could do that every day for whatever I could write. And that's me after my second book. You know, maybe for you, you don't you don't gotta write 500 page book or 200 page book. You gotta write 200 words today. You feel me? Like you gotta write 100 words today. And, and then, you know, over time, something goes, but eventually that has to be the non-negotiable. It's, it's like, it's, it, it would be the same thing with like, I feel like I'm for, sort of fortunate. I play like high school ba basketball or whatever. At some point you gotta, you gotta go to the gym or not, you know? Do you wanna be in a team or not? <laughs> I've been kept from the team before. And I remember being like, me and my bro were like, well, he was really, cause I went to quit. He was like, no, we're training today. And today being the day after we got cut and we're training from then to the next year. And like, you know what I mean? Like, that's what it is to me. Like, to me, like that is like the heart. And that's hard to say. Cause I feel it's almost too like authoritative or something, you know, but I just, to me, when I, I think this, I think that people think of discipline as like something you either have or you don't have. No, it's a muscle that can be grown. And so how do you do it? Maybe it's 50 words a day today. Tomorrow will be two, so tomorrow will be um, 100. Next day will be 200. Nobody just wakes up and runs a marathon. They run a little bit. Then they run a little bit more. 10 minutes more tomorrow. 10 minutes more tomorrow. So to me, anyways, all that to say, whatever your craft is or your work is, the sooner you can embrace that discipline. Like you're, to me, if you're going to be a, I mean, I think you could like, re in reality, the way the world is now, you could kind of have like a, I don't know, like a like a a sort of shallow existence in an art space if you just like just off a of hype and cloud or whatever that type of stuff. But if you want to do it for real, to me, uh, if you can grow a practice that involves a disciplined approach to discovery and being like elated by your own ability to discover what you can do, uh, there's a great chance that you could uh, enjoy a creative life. And I'm totally not talking about professionally or whatever i'm just talking about within yourself because eventually it's going to become a fun thing you're going to be interested in how you could push yourself eventually you get to that place but it's a muscle that gets has to be grown and so the earlier you it sort of internalize that i think the sooner things could get moving but again that's just you know that's just me <laughs> it's a good question really important question thank you thank you was there one more jen yep there's another uh from tyler so what I want to know is, I guess, what kind of writerly rituals do you do you have? Do you write at a certain time every day? Do you try to find as much time as you can? Do you get up and have a cup of coffee, which is what a lot of people do? Do you have a certain ritual that helps you get to write every day? You know, it's crazy. First of all, I don't even drink coffee at all. I drank coffee the other day, and I was like, I can't believe y'all do this every day. I felt like I was on, like, drugs. Like, it was so intense. Um, but I do like a chai latte. So that's maybe my closest thing. Um, when I'm really, really, really tapped in. Yeah. I, I like when I was really tapped in, I try to do like a thousand words a day, but right now I couldn't do that. Cause I'm like almost not in shape for it. You know, um, I, if I really, really feel connected to a project, I'll be like, 
So this is like when I was when I was in peak chain gang novel form, I'd be like, I wake up, go to the gym, meditate, uh, write for either two hours or a thousand words, whichever came first, but almost always a thousand words came first. Um, because I even I even trained myself to stop a little bit before like the gas tank ran out all the way. Like I'll I'll know what the next paragraph is, but I'll just stop myself to give myself like a primer for the next day, you know? And so that the next, cause it is sometimes if you just, if you're starting from zero again, you're like, oh, fuck, you know, nah, nah. no, I, I already know. I was, I was already almost thirsty to get back into it. So I stopped a little bit short, um, right for my little two hours or whatever. And then by the time I would be done writing, I would get to eat my first meal. And that was like my like reward. So I almost created this like Pavlonian, like desire in myself now, because now I'm getting hungry. So I'm like trying to get the words out, you know, just to get, just to, just to get to like enjoy my little whatever I'm about to get. Then I'd have like a um like a little recreation time, whatever that was gonna be, work on probably a different creative project, like some screenwriting thing or whatever. If I was feeling really, really, really good, I'd go back to the writing the book, but I probably want it. And then uh you know, eating and whatever. But the beginning of the day was like, wake up, gym, meditate, work on writing, food. And and then after the food, after I wrote, I felt so good about myself. I was like, I, today was a win. And I just had like these W's, W's, W's on a board. And it helped me create this really good momentum. That's beautiful. Thank That's you. That's ideal though. Thank you. I'm not always on that. Like, but when I'm really in it, I'm, I'm, I do that. <clears throat> Uh, one more opportunity for our students who are here with us to ask a question. If you just raise your hand, we'll have time for one or two more. If you'd like to ask Nana something before we uh, wrap up. Anyone else? Yes, Aiden. Um, I guess I think dystopia is an interesting genre because I've only read a bit and it's like the, the famous stuff like Hunger Games, Handmaid's Tale. Um, what were there any, do you have any influence for how you approached writing a more dystopian type of novel? And um, what sort of like elements or whatnot you, you used in that creative process there? For me, the dystopias that I am interested in usually take an element of our current existence that is more that's hidden from the general public and put it into the forefront. So in this case of chain gang, it's really real that human beings will be executed or murdered <laughs> by the government. It's really real that people make money off of people being imprisoned. It's really real that slavery is explicitly protected famously by the 13th amendment. So all those things are kind of in like the background of our lives. So for me, I just put it into the foreground and now it feels dystopic, which is why I always say dystopia now. If I wrote a story where bombs drop out of the sky in the hospital and you, you get obliterated, that feels like a dystopia. But for somebody that is the situation and the bomb was dropped by America. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Like dystopia is now. Uh, people talk to Margaret Atwood all the time because of like the idea of Handmaiden's Tale and like that whole situation for many people, like that is the experience of being a woman right now, dystopia is now. So to me, the whole dystopia thing is, is not so much about like, it's like just taking like the stuff. And again, what do we mean when we say dystopia? I feel like that term is used like sort of like broadly. I like to, some people think of like the world is like ended or whatever. I think if I, last time I looked it up, it had to do something with the idea that like uh, systemic unnecessary suffering, or maybe not even that word systemic, but I think of it as systemic unnecessary suffering. And what else could this world be but that? We know about the wealth disparity. We know how much food we burn because it, like it's economically not sound to not. We know about, <laughs> I mean, we know about the quality of the air. We know about the lead in the air and the gas and the pain. And what do you, what do I, you know what I mean? You just go on forever. And so for me, it's just by taking a little bit of focus onto those things. Also, I think it's also very important to, to mention that the horror, not was, the horror notwithstanding, it's still a beautiful world we live in. 
that life is still very precious. And that's sort of why I feel compelled to even give up. I went to curse there to, to even to even say anything about it. And so to me, that's what I think about what the dystopia is. At least that's like what's in my heart. In terms of crafting the actual world, it's about being specific and um, vigilant on the sentence level, being very specific on every level that you can like sort of muster while still allowing the story to be about the story and not about how cool this random gadget from your imagination is. Ah, sorry, good question. Thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone. One more in the chat. I'll answer him. I'll answer it. There's one more in the chat. Sorry. One more. Sorry. Was that right. Tyler? Tyler, did you want to unmute again? <laughs> I got it. Okay. You. So basically, I'm also going to U Albany and I have a couple of English professors and they've been really great and helpful, with, like pushing me to read and all that. But I was yep. wondering if you had any outside resources that you looked at, such as books or essays that you really think helped you creatively or even inspired you or push you to create more. So for a long time, I had like, and I'm grateful for Professor Schwarzschild and I'm trying to remember another professor that I had who I remember, and she was, she was one of my professors for like the advanced group thing. Anyways, it's something small, but like I, I was like my, I was never taught like proper grammar, you know, and I still don't view like there is no, there's, there's a lot of like hegemonic weirdness about the idea of grammar, but I didn't have usage, consistent usage tools for myself even. Even though like, I mean, I knew the very basics, but like, anyways, I'll have to say like the strunk and white, the elements of style, the book, the elements of style is a very basic book, but that like reading that internalizing how I wanted to use punctuation was like, that feels small, but it ended up being like super important to me, actually. My older sister got it for me, um, but that might be very basic for some people, but for me, it wasn't. Um, John Gardner's book on the craft of writing, I think it's called, was super important to me. Again, it was going to come off as very old school to some people, but this is also just what I had. I didn't, I didn't know, you know what I mean? I just, but I internalized and read the whole book cover to cover. This is like a craft book like this, you know? Um, I did that. But I, I think that the important resources are the library. And um, I wasn't super tapped into the literary world at that age, but I was like, I knew about like literary magazines because I just saw them in the in the in the in the Barnes and Nobles by me, and I would look at them and just see like what some of like the newer writers were doing, and I remember seeing Lydia Davis's name on one and when like she was and I was at Albany it felt so cool to me that like oh I know this like writer who's there, and like plowshares or whatever. Um. And 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 poets and writers things like poets and writers that's a magazine. Those things can be cool because it lets you know like who's like sort of doing things right now. And you can start kind of start thinking about people like your contemporaries. I like the poets and writers the way I looked at like um like Slam magazine when I was in um playing basketball, like when Slam does like their high school edition. And I'd be like, those was like my contemporaries who were better than me, you know. Uh, even though I wasn't gonna play pro basketball or even D1, I I liked to see like who was like cooking, you know what I'm saying? And so Things like poets and writers help me feel slightly connected to this thing that was very, very, very far away from me for a long time. And it's weird. Now I would go to the poets and writers, they have a gal in the city and I go, then I still feel far away from it because those people are not, <laughs> you know, it's a whole different type of people. But um, I know I belong there based on my writing. So those things are sort of helpful. Um, but the number one thing is always just reading things you like, reading widely, reading deeply. And that's always to me like the North Star. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. I actually own one of those. Sorry. You own what? I actually own um, The Art of Fiction by John Gardner, and I have Strunk and White. I just haven't got to read Strunk and White yet. There you go. <laughs> Look at that. Excellent. You're on your way, Tyler. There was so much. Um, this was so generous, Nana. Uh, so many things to take away. I especially love inspiring a lot of young aspiring authors here that writing is a discipline it's a muscle that you can build you you you've given very pragmatic suggestions about how they can do it as well um but this book chain gang all stars coming out may 2nd is going to blow your mind it's going to be a huge literary event 
I want you to know that you can order it here from our campus bookstore. We also have Friday Black here for sale. We will make sure that Nana can sign some book plates somehow for you so it will be autographed. We're really excited to honor you on April 2nd, Nana, as a distinguished alumnus in excellence in arts and letters. Please join me in thanking and congratulating Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. Thank you, Nana. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, everyone. It really means a lot to me. You know, I'm gang with y'all. Y'all still do the UA? Yeah, I don't know if y'all still do it. <laughs> yes. You Thank you. Know. Have a great weekend, everyone.